Well, looks like Hank is all ready to give us the story on the new Red Ram V8 engine. Right, and from the looks of it, he's raring to get started. Hiya, Hank. Well, you two fellas got here on the dock. Seen anything of Tech? Let's be careful how you toss my name around. I've never been late for a meeting in my life. Get on with the show. Good. It looks like we're all present and accounted for. Why don't you get right up here on the engine, Tech, where we can all hear you? Good idea. And now I suppose you're going to tell the boys about this great new Dodge Red Ram V8 engine. And boy, is this an engine. 140 horsepower, 7.1 to 1 compression ratio. Lots of get up. Say, you're really wound up about this engine. <laughs> How about giving me a chance to say something, too? If it's about this engine, go to it. Thanks. You know, tech has got a right to be enthusiastic about this engine's features. And remember, this is only one of the Chrysler Corporation's great new line of V8 engines. Chrysler, DeSoto, and now Dodge. While these V8 engines are similar in many respects, there are certain features of the Dodge engine that are different. These are the features we want to talk about. For example, you'll notice that this front mounting retains the floating power feature instead of being mounted to the frame at four points. This means that the engine is mounted at three points, one at the front and two at the rear, in live rubber. This prevents sound or vibration being transmitted to the body. Say, Hank, I've got a question. What's the oil change story on this new red ram? That's a good question, Cliff. There's quite an oil story to tell. On any Chrysler-built V8 engine without the torque converter, the initial oil change period is at 500 miles. From then on, change the oil at 5,000-mile intervals, or seasonally, whichever occurs first. Now then, on any Chrysler-built V8 engine with the engine-fed torque converter, there is no early oil change period. You just change the oil as the seasons change, twice a year, spring and fall. That's because of the larger volume of oil. The oil stays cleaner for a longer period of time. However, the oil filter should be changed regularly at 5,000 miles. 5,000 miles, eh? Right, Bart. Under the usual driving conditions, that should be sufficient. But don't forget it. With the close tolerances in this engine, clean oil is doubly important to good performance and long life. I suppose the oil level should be up to the full mark on the dipstick at all times. Well, not necessarily, Cliff. When the oil level is down to the add oil mark, add only one quart of oil. One quart brings the level up to full. Remember, there's usually some oil up in the engine that will drain down. The best time to check oil level is a few minutes after the engine has been shut off. That's because with a torque converter, oil can drain back to the engine from the converter if the car has been standing for some time, like overnight. Then the level will appear to be too high. That's a good point, Tech. You don't want to have the oil level too low or too high. Overfilling will only lead to oil foaming. Oil foaming means air bubbles in the oil. Those bubbles carried in the oil to the hydraulic tappets cause them to become noisy. Yeah. I suppose on any of these V8 engines, you have to drain the crankcase and add new oil before delivering the car to the customer. I'll break your arm if I catch you doing that. The oil that's in the car will give proper lubrication until the first oil change period comes up. You mentioned hydraulic tappets a moment ago, Hank. Are they any different from those used in the other V8s? Well, yes, they are, Cliff. And there are two different types used in the Red Ram engines. In addition to the parts being of different size, the most easily recognized difference is the check valve. On one type, the plunger has a ball check valve. And on the other, the check valve is flat and is spring-loaded. But the two units are interchangeable as complete assemblies. These hydraulic tappets are oil-fed through drilled passages, which lead from the main oil galleries. When the engine starts, oil under pressure is immediately fed to the main oil galleries of both banks, and from there to the tappets. It is natural for oil to be forced out of some of the hydraulic tappets overnight, particularly those that were holding valves open when the engine stopped. Correct, my boy. And under that condition, those tappets would be noisy when the engine was started, but would quiet down in a few seconds as soon as they fill up with oil. Right. Now let's take a look at this generator. You'll notice that it's located right at the front of the right bank of cylinders. And it's pivoted at the bottom on its mounting bracket. That clamp bolt there in the slotted adjusting strap holds the generator in position. Hey, 
That's all right. Makes fan belt adjustment a cinch, doesn't it? It certainly does, Cliff. You just move the generator in or out until the fan belt can be depressed one half inch between the generator pulley and the fan pulley. Then tighten that adjusting strap bolt. And now let's give them the story on the spark plugs, Hank. Okay, slave driver. I'll give them the story on replacing a plug. But uh, before I do, I'd better say that the spark plugs are 4S140 with a gap of 35 thousandths. It might not be a bad idea to review installation of the plugs, Hank. Okay, Tech, will do. If you have occasion to replace one of those plugs, don't use a gasket. A gasket will position the plug too far out of the combustion chamber and will make the plug run too hot due to poor heat transfer. The tube takes the place of the gasket. And here's something to remember. Make sure the base of the tube is clean. A dirty tube makes a poor seal, and you're apt to lose compression. Uh, let me show you how to install a plug. Use a thin wall deep socket wrench. Turn the wrench over and place the plug in the socket. Then place the metal tube with the rubber seal in place on the tube over the spark plug and wrench. And make sure that plug sticks out of the tube. Right, Tech. Now hold these parts together and insert the plug in the spark plug opening. When the plug is in place, tighten it to from 30 to 32 foot-pounds torque. Now you're ready to install the spark plug tube seal retainer. That's the steel ring. Just place the retainer on the seal. When the cover is installed, it will force the retainer down against the seal. Now install the cable on the plug by pushing down firmly on the insulator. And make sure that cable is in place securely by pulling up lightly on the cable. If it is firmly in place, you'll get resistance on the pull. You'd better tell them about those U-shaped cable clips, Hank. Hey, that's right. You'll find these U-clips in the three rear spark plug tubes on each bank of cylinders. These clips are something new and are being used on Chrysler and DeSoto VHs, too. If you have to replace one of the three rear plugs, it'll be necessary to reinstall these clips to hold the cable in its proper position and prevent it from becoming pinched under the cover. Well, now we're ready to install the spark plug cable cover. Notice that one end of this cover has a long slope. This slope should be installed facing the rear of the engine. If you put it on backward, the spark plug wires will become pinched and water can be forced in under the cover. I suppose you're going to follow up this spark plug story with a review of the double breaker type distributor, eh, Hank? That's right, Tech. Suppose I start out by explaining just how the double breaker distributor works. Remember, if the distributor had only one set of points, the eight-lobe cam would not allow sufficient time for primary current buildup in the ignition coil at high speeds and would increase the possibility of a high-speed miss. Correct, my boy. With double breaker points, you get a better spark at high speed. The two sets of points operate as a team to complete and open the circuit to the coil. Right. The points are connected in parallel between the coil and ground. And that means that as long as either set of points is closed, the primary circuit to ground is completed and the current is flowing through the coil. You mean that both sets of points open and close at the same time? Oh, no, Cliff. Their operation overlaps, giving a greater dwell period. This allows more time for primary current to build up. But how does this work, Hank? I... Well, I just don't get this overlapping you speak of. Well, let me explain a little more then, Cliff. Hold it right there, Hank. Somebody better turn this record before you tell us about overlapping. As the cam rotates in a clockwise direction, the first set of points closes the primary circuit. This set of points is called the maker points. Now, as the maker points close, current flows through the primary windings of the coil and the magnetic field starts to build up. As the cam continues to rotate, the second or breaker set of points closes. However, this does not affect the buildup of the magnetic field because the circuit was already completed when the first or maker set of points closed. This clip is what I meant by the points overlapping in operation. As the cam continues to rotate, the maker points open. But this does not break the primary circuit because the second set of points is still closed. But when that second set of points opens, the circuit is broken. Then the magnetic field in the coil collapses, producing the spark at the plugs. This second set of points is called the breaker points because it breaks the primary circuit. Good job, Hank. That shows you the importance of setting each set of points within specifications. 
If you don't, the primary current buildup time will be changed, and this will affect the spark at the plug and consequently engine performance. While we're talking about points, Hank, why don't you show the boys how to set point gap? A good idea, Tech. Are you going to check it on the engine, Hank? You can, Cliff, but it's easier to do if you remove the distributor and take it to a bench. Then you don't have to fuss with cranking the engine against compression in an attempt to get the rubbing block on the high point of the distributor cam. Here's how you remove the distributor. First, we remove the cap and push it to one side. Then we disconnect the primary wire and the vacuum chamber tube. And be sure to mark the position of that rotor so you'll know where to place it when you put the distributor back. Now, remove the clamp bolt and the clamp and lift the distributor straight up and away from the engine. And be mighty careful not to misplace that oil seal ring that goes between the distributor and its seat. That's a good tip, Tech. Setting point gap is easy. Start out by rotating the distributor shaft until the rubbing block of the points to be checked is on the high point of the cam. Uh, right here, I better tell you that there are two different methods of setting point gap. One is with a feeler gauge and the other is with the dial indicator. Which method do you recommend, Hank? Well, that depends upon the condition of the points, Cliff. On new points, I'd use a feeler gauge. If the points were slightly used, I'd set the gap with a dial indicator. The important point is to be sure that each set has the same gap, 15 to 18 thousandths. What if the point gap is incorrect? If the point gap is not correct, loosen the lock screw, insert a screwdriver into the triangular opening in the breaker plate, and turn the screwdriver blade against the stationary point plate until the desired gap is obtained. Then tighten the lock screw. You better tell them about checking dwell angle, Hank. Right. After a distributor has been in service for some time, it's a good idea to check it for proper dwell angle. That will give you a quick check on the condition of the moving parts of the distributor. With the point gap properly set at 15 to 18 thousandths, the dwell should be from 26 to 28 degrees for each set of points and 34 degrees, plus or minus 2 degrees, for the total dwell of both sets of points. What are some of the things that could cause the dwell angle to be off, Hank? Well, there are a number of causes, Cliff. A worn rubbing block, a rubbing block that is not square with the cam, a worn drive shaft bushing, and if the distributor is very old, you might even find a badly worn cam. Are there any cautions for reinstalling the distributor in the engine, Hank? Yes, there are a few points it would be well to emphasize, Bart. First, you want to be certain that the oil seal ring is in place to prevent an oil leak. Then, if the engine has not been turned over while the distributor was out, mesh the distributor shaft with the drive gear, holding the rotor in the same position as it was when it was removed. Then install the clamp and tighten the bolt. What happens if the engine has been turned over while the distributor is out? Well, in that case, Cliff, you'd have to reset the timing. You'll find that story in the reference book. When you connect the primary wire to the distributor terminal, be sure it is the one that's connected to the positive terminal of the coil. You'll get a better spark at the plug if it is. Now, I suppose you're going to show us how to check the ignition timing, Hank. Right. That's the next step. Uh, hand me that timing light and adapter off the bench, Cliff. Adapter? Hmm. What's it for? Well, we need this adapter because we can't connect the timing light to the number one spark plug as we normally would. And don't let me catch any of you forcing the teeth of that clip through the insulation on the spark plug wire. Break down that insulation and you'll run into trouble. So use that adapter. Right, Tech. And here's how. First, remove the number one spark plug wire from the distributor cap. That's the wire with the red rubber cap. Insert the timing light adapter into the number one tower of the distributor cap. Then insert the spark plug wire in the other end of the adapter. Now we clip the timing light blue wire to the upper end of the adapter, the black wire to the battery negative post, and the red wire to the battery positive post. Now with the engine warmed up to normal operating temperature, and with the engine running at a slow idle, 475 to 500 RPM, See that the timing light flashes when the timing mark on the crankshaft pulley is in line with the pointer. That timing mark is four degrees before top dead center. I suppose if the timing is off, you can reset it by rotating the distributor. Clockwise retards the timing, counterclockwise advances it, right? Right on the nose, Bart. 
Now, let's talk about the carburetor. It is a Stromberg dual-throat downdraft type, but uses a slightly different principle of conducting heat to the throttle valves. You remember that on the Chrysler and DeSoto V8s, the carburetor has a water jacket in the throttle body. On the Stromberg, the walls of the throttle body are thin to conduct heat around the throttle valves and prevent icing during damp, cold weather. Like the other carburetors, this Stromberg has a built-in automatic choke. The heat tube for the choke runs from the right exhaust manifold and is covered with asbestos. I want to cover two points of carburetor adjustment. Both adjustments can be made with the carburetor on the engine. This is the carburetor found on engines equipped with the torque converter and fluid drive. First, there's the dash pot plunger adjustment. You'll find this plunger just above the throttle lever. That dash pot is what eases the throttle back to the idle position instead of letting it snap back quickly. Prevents engine stalling. A correctly adjusted plunger should have one sixteenth of an inch plunger inward travel when the throttle is returned to the low idle position. You adjust it by turning the plunger adjusting screw in or out. Right, Tech. And now let's talk about the idle adjustment. But before you do, you fellas want to remember that no amount of carburetor adjustment will make a smooth idling engine unless all other factors such as plugs, points, and spark timing are correct. You couldn't have said anything more important, Tech. And now let me show you how you would make a preliminary setting of the idle mixture adjusting screws to synchronize the pair. Turn each screw in carefully until it seats. Then back it out one full turn. And be careful you don't force the screw onto its seat. You'll bend the screw or damage the seat and then you'll never get a good adjustment. A good point, Tech. Then, when the engine has reached normal operating temperature, attach this tachometer and adjust the idle speed screw to get between 475 and 500 RPM. And remember, listen for roughness in the engine, as well as for fluffs at the tailpipe. Right, Tech. Now, if the setting wasn't right, you'd turn both idle mixture adjusting screws at the same time, one-eighth turn, either in or out, to get a smooth idle. The best idle operation will normally be with the screws set somewhere between three-quarters and one and one-quarter turns open. When you road test the car, you may have to reset ignition timing. Timing should be set so you have a slight ping under hard acceleration. Then back it off until the ping is no longer heard. And remember, some grades of gasoline will often give you a ping, where others will not. If you get a ping, retard the spark. Well, now, looks like we've covered the main features of this new Dodge engine. Of course, you'll find more details in the reference book. Now, are there any more... Hey, Tech, you leaving so quick? Yeah, gotta get a good night's sleep. I'm heading out bright and early tomorrow to visit some more of the boys. Before I leave, let me say that it's going to be a pleasure to work on this new Red Ram engine. It's been engineered with service in mind. And that we mechanics appreciate. Just keep in mind that this engine is precision built. If you service it properly, so it performs like it should, your owners are going to be mighty happy with it. So long, Tech, and thanks again for being here. The pleasure is mine, my boy. I'll be seeing you. <laughs>